Terms and distance charges apply, provided by Caribbean Telecom. Marijuana, because whatever you say about marijuana compared to alcohol or cigarettes, we know that the impact on the developing brain uh, is, uh, is, is something we need to prevent. Marijuana and young brains paints a scary picture. Uh, brain development. Attractive to kids. Among young people. And keeping it away from kids. Tell that to the 20,000 people are going to get a record well, this year. Well, mm -hmm. Murray, what I would tell to anyone who's breaking the law is don't. That they should obey the law. Protecting our kids. Talk to your teen about pot. Uh, properly by protecting our young people, by ensuring young people. Marijuana use by youth. And children getting a hold of these marijuana lace candy bars. Marijuana use during adolescence. She was smelling a lot of marijuana in the house and she knew that it was bad, uh, and then her mother told her, Get tough, get creative, just get through. And you smoke a lot of pot? Yep. I hear you smoke 15 joints a day. David Malmo Levine. David Malmo Levine. Malmo Levine. David Malmo Levine. David Malmo Levine. David Malmo Levine. Malmo Levine. David Malmo Levine. Okay, so let's get you two to weigh in on, on the age factor, because that'll be a big top line, I think, for lots of people. Well, it's 25 years of research. It's, I basically, I started reading about hemp in 1992 when I read The Emperor Wears No Clothes. And then I've read every book I can on the subject, not of just of, of hemp and cannabis, but of drugs in general. I opened up a herb museum. Uh, I... I defended myself at the Supreme Court of Canada on pot dealing charges, R.V. Malmo Levine, 2003. Uh, I opened up a dispensary called the Stress and Depressed Association. I opened up a pot club called the Harm Reduction Club and another one called the Herb School. Um, been arrested many times uh, over pot offenses, but never had a victim, never had someone who was actually harmed by my actions. I think the problem with that sentence is the word allowing. Teens are smoking pot right now. In fact, I would say the law deters teens even less than it deters adults because adults have considerations, they get drug tested more, uh, they've got responsibilities, they don't have as much free time. Teens are the ones that are smoking and getting high and driving around right now. In fact, they are getting high more often in their cars than need be because we don't provide them a lounge to smoke in. They're currently, right now, in Vancouver, teens have to get high in their cars because they're not allowed in the vapor lounges. That should all change. We should have safe places for teens to smoke so they don't have to drive around in their cars. But they, most teens are smoking pot regardless of what we allow them to do. It's like saying we allow them to have sex. Actually, no, that, that decision, after the age of 12 or 13, it's basically in their domain because we can't monitor teens 24-7, 365. Heck, teens were getting high and having sex in the maximum security jail I used to work at in Edmonton, the Edmonton Young Offender Center. Uh, and we were warned not to sell them drugs or buy sex from them when we entered in as staff because that was an ongoing reoccurring problem. So if you can't stop a teen from fucking or smoking pot or getting high in jail, what makes you think you can stop them from doing those things out of jail? You can't. A certain amount of autonomy is a given. It's, it's just a requirement of being a human being. And if you deny them that much autonomy, then oh, you've nerfed the world. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like that. No, you have to assume that these decisions are going to be made by teens anyway, and given the fact that they can read, you know, um, these reports and assess the harm level of cannabis relative to other harms or relative to not using any drugs whatsoever, and they can make these decisions, and they probably will, they'll continue to get high without our permission. Maybe we should just instead make the situation as safe as possible for them. I think that's the reasonable way to go. Well, I was in the Supreme Court. In 1996, I got busted for selling pot out in the open in an organization called the Harm Reduction Club. We tried to teach our customers 
how to avoid harming themselves with cannabis by offering them a safer, smarter smoking guide along with their club membership. And to make a long story short, made it up to the Supreme Court at Canada level. My argument was uh, Section 7 and 15 of the Constitution protect harmless people. And while not all use or growing or dealing is harmless, all proper use and proper growing and proper dealing is harmless and therefore protected by Section 7 and 15. Casanova once said, in wise hands, poison is medicine, and in foolish hands, medicine is poison. And that's another way of looking at drugs. Uh, Andrew Wheel said much the same thing uh, when he said there's uh, no such thing as good or bad drugs. Uh, there's only good or bad relationships with drugs. So we have to evolve our way of seeing cannabis not as inherently harmful but dependent upon our actions and our awareness and our knowledge and we should stop seeing uh, drugs as temptations and see them as instead as tools that can be used properly or misused research it and use it properly and 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 select the terpenes that work best for us and and become shamans and control our own lives you know through drug autonomy and vocation autonomy uh, i think complete sexual, political, uh, emotional autonomy come and, and we become kings and queens of our own lives. Well, like I said, you want to keep the high pleasure, low pressure activity. And the reason you want to do that is cannabis also has time slowdown or time dilation effects. A minute feels like an hour when you first start smoking pot. So you want to stretch out those sensations during pleasurable activity when you're having an ice cream, watching a favorite movie, making love, things like that. You don't want to go to a funeral or identify a body or go take a test on a subject you're not very good at and stretch that feeling out. I didn't want to smoke pot in jail because I didn't enjoy jail. But when I got out, yeah, I wanted to get high because being free is pleasurable and and basically I limited it to only to activities I enjoyed. And I found out, you know what, I like smoking pot better than doing unenjoyable activities. So I, I tried to limit my activities to only activities I enjoyed after becoming a pothead. And that's kind of an effect that pot has on you is that you start to plan your life around your own, uh, what makes you happy, which I think is a positive effect. Well, look at psychosis rates over time. It's simple. Between the 70s and the 90s, cannabis use rates increased fivefold. Five times. It's like 10% to 50% of the population trying it. 3% uh, to 30% or 3% to 15% uh, regular use. Depends on what you define as regular use. But dramatic increase in cannabis use rates throughout the Western world, everywhere you look. In McLeod, et cetera, all, 2004, they looked at Britain and Sweden as two examples of Western world cannabis use rates increase. They did not notice a matching increase in psychosis rates. And you can't find it. I looked for it in Canada or anywhere else. It varies between 1% or 2% in all the Western nations. There's no evidence that IQs are dropping in general population statistics, even though there's a five-fold increase in cannabis use rates in the 70s to the 90s. Why is that? You've got to ask yourself, why is it that if cannabis inherently makes us stupider and we're using way more cannabis than ever before, why isn't it showing up in uh, IQ rates? Why are they increasing? Why, why are we getting smarter every year? if cannabis makes us stupider? And the answer is, there is a huge amount of a conflict of interest in Reefer Madness 2.0. It justifies uh, a continued increase in police budgets. It justifies a monopoly uh, for medicine uh, in licensed producers and people who can afford to jump through all the regulatory hoops that are justified through this Reefer Madness. And it, it uh, justifies the overregulation of industrial hemp which allows the fuel fossil fuel industries to continue to rule the world that's all the money that's behind 
the perpetuation of reefer madness 2.0. That's the reason they're lying about pot. It's actually, there's no gen pop stats that back up what they're saying, and they avoid even talking about them. I went to Vancouver Coastal Health. I said, look at the gen pot stats, evidence. They said, la, 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 we won't discuss it. We won't talk about it. Same thing with City Hall. Same thing with the Canadian Center for Substance Abuse. Same thing with every prohibitionist and every person who argues these tight regulations are necessary. They won't look at the evidence. They won't discuss the evidence. That is an indication to me that I'm right and they're wrong. And they're just part of this huge scapegoating edifice that happens every generation. It's sometimes the witches, sometimes the Muslims, sometimes the homosexuals, sometimes the druggies, sometimes it's Socrates. But everyone's accused of harming the young and you have to look closely at the evidence to see if that's another lie or if it's actually the truth. And in this case, it's a lie. If they can manage caffeine, which is a far more dangerous drug than cannabis, if they can avoid overdose deaths, overuse deaths, withdrawal symptoms, toxicity, acute toxicity from caffeine, then they're probably able to do the same thing with cannabis, which is a less toxic, less dangerous, less harmful drug than caffeine. The only area that cannabis is more dangerous than caffeine is in the impairment levels of novice users. Now, if we were to, say, for example, adopt the Senate recommendations of 16-year-olds being able to buy their own cannabis, and to add to that, we had a public education campaign meant to be able to help people identify impairment and to insist that teens and everyone else refrain from the use of heavy machinery, including, but not limited to cars, when they are impaired, I think we can reduce the number of cannabis-related incidents to zero or a level lower than the current levels of caffeine abuse in society today. Typically, it's not taken in amounts that would impair you. But it can be. It's not like it never impairs you. Say you're driving all night on the road and you're either poor or you have no time to or you can't find food, but you can find coffee. You can find coffee at every gas station along the way. And I bet you there are people on the highway right now jacked up on caffeine. They've over-caffeinated. Their eyes start to shift and misfocus. Their hands become jittery. Their heart rate increases and they're impaired on caffeine and they're not safe to drive. Should we ban the use of caffeine because of that? Should we pull over and test the number of nanograms of caffeine in someone's blood and then take away their right to drive because they tested positive for caffeine? No, it should be based on impairment. Same thing with impairment from lack of sleep or old age or illness or prescription medication or emotional disturbance, or any other reason for impairment. Walk a straight line, touch your nose, count backwards from 100. Performance testing. If you're impaired, if your performance is impaired, if it's videotaped by the, the, the cop doing the test, and it, it holds up in court, then get that person off the road. It doesn't matter why they're impaired. Figuring out why they're impaired seems to me uh, an investigation that only benefits scapegoaters and people who want to punish people for not being impaired, just being high, but on the road. Now, if you don't care why someone's impaired, then you are putting the immorality of being impaired on the road on the same level, regardless of the reason you're impaired, which I think is what we should do and the message we should send to our young people. It doesn't matter why you're impaired, get off the road. If you can't pass an RCMP impairment test, don't even get in the car. Stay a while, sleep, wait till the drugs wear off or whatever. Get right so that you can drive again. And that's the message we should be sending to everybody. If you, teens are going to talk to their parents, they should know their stuff. Go to potfacts.ca, memorize all those facts, and just address the concerns uh, as you get them, or, or don't even have to go to popfacts.ca. There's a hundred good sources of information of cannabis on the internet.
Learn your stuff though. Learn about this information and then address the concerns. Argue it's not inherently harmful like caffeine and other drugs. It's how you use it that determines whether you're harmed by it. And argue that you can use it properly without hurting yourself and that you should have the right to because you want to take advantage of its medical benefits. An another great source of that information is my book, Does Cannabis Inherently Harm the Developing Minds of Young People? And another great source of information is my website, potfacts.ca. Now, if you want to learn more about cannabis and teens, uh, Google all those things. There is an a, a eco-activist, an environmental activist in Edmonton who taught me a very important lesson. Uh, his name was Tucker Gomberg, and he said, well, it's easier to get forgiven than permission. So a lot of the time, it's just breaking the rules, but doing it in a conscious and harmless way, and then pleading your case. I mean, all the rules that make no sense should be broken and then removed through court challenges and through the court of public opinion. And I think the ones that harm the most people should be addressed first. So I, I just tell everyone, just become the dealer you wish to see in the world. And if you do get busted, take some of that money you made, spend it either on lawyers or on an education campaign, and teach people that you were not hurting anybody and no one should hurt you as a result. And so uh, my next article for Cannabis Culture will be um, become the change you wish to see or uh, be what you wish to see, uh, how to defend yourself in court from semi-legalization. And it'll be a how-to, uh, conduct your own civil disobedience in your own defense in court. So, hug power is how to make it difficult for the cops to arrest you without a kerfuffle. They don't like being caught using force on camera without justification. And if you are an engaged in a pot smoking where you're smoking pot or you have a few plants with you or you're dealing pot and you don't want to be arrested, uh, sometimes arrest resistance works. And that means not touching the cops, not saying an impolite word to the cops, going over to the person getting arrested who shouldn't be getting arrested, who's not harming anyone, giving that person a hug and not letting go for any reason. And then they got to throw two of you in the paddy wagon. They also got to separate you before they throw you in the paddy wagon because two people hugging each other will not fit through a door of a paddy wagon. Ha! Funny that. They don't build them for huggers. So then they have to use force. And if you're surrounded by people with phone cameras, then that force is going to be caught on film. Uh, if you get hugged by a lot of people, then it's even harder for them to throw you in a paddy wagon. Comic book, the 420 page comic book called Vance to Damn Comics, uh, took 10 years to produce and my entire adult life to research. It's basically everything I learned being a pot activist these last 25 years. Uh, summed up and then illustrated by my friend Bob Hyde. It's huge, it's a massive, it's like a textbook of history and law about drugs, so you're gonna wanna check that out.